with some old friends that I haven't seen in many years, and a lot of people that I've been corresponding with for many years have never actually met before. So I'm going to talk today to you about an update of recent research in near-death experiences. And that's all, all I'm going to say for right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to switch the table real quick. <laughs> A good part. <laughs> it's all good. These are the fastest three hours of my month, I have to tell you. It goes so quickly, I can't even believe it's three hours. Uh, well, we probably can go until 5, 10, to allow you an hour and a half if, if you want to take that. It's fine. Um, Dr. Grayson is one of the world's foremost near-death researchers. He's from the University of Virginia, an editor of the Journal for Near-Death Studies. He was one of the founding members of IANS, and he served for many years on the board of directors and as IANS president, as director of research, and for the past 23 years, editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies. And you're also the founder of that, isn't, aren't you? So he's the only one who's done that. Dr. Grayson graduated from Cornell University with a major in psychology, received his medical degree from the SUNY Upstate Medical College, and completed his psychiatric residency at the University of Virginia. He practiced and taught psychiatry at the University of Michigan and the University of Connecticut, where he was clinical chief of psychiatry before returning to the University of Virginia 10 years ago, where he is now a Carlson professor of psychiatry and director of the Division of Perceptual Studies. His near-death research for the past three decades has focused on the after effects of the experience and has resulted in 70 presentations to national scientific conferences, 100 publications in academic, medical, and psychological journals, and several research grants and awards. And we are very, very honored to have him here today. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Bruce Grayson. Research has been based on questionnaires that patient volunteers have been filling out for me. And it was a delight to, to see Charlene, who's been filling out questionnaires, and Ted. Actually, Ted's been filling out questionnaires for about a quarter of a century for me. I <laughs> <laughs> heard him mention before that he didn't have a near death experience. He's in what scientists call the control group. <laughs> Charlene, on the other hand, is in the out of control group. <laughs> always end promptly at 5, and Diana is gracious to give me an extra 10 minutes. Um, so I'll try to stop substantially before that time. So I'm going to be talking about an update on recent near-death research. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why I said that. Um, I have lots of things that I'm prepared to talk about, but many times after I've given what I think is a very riveting presentation. Someone comes up to me at the end and says, you know, that was interesting, but what I really wanted to hear about was such and such. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen tonight. So in addition to my agenda, is there anything in particular that you want me to talk about? Yeah. Would you be able to desecrate your menu, so to speak? <laughs> 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 Repeat the menu. Let me repeat the question. Would you be able to say the title and so we can share how we're going to describe it? An outline of your, your, your subject. Oh. Your title. No. I'm just going to talk.
wants to hear what's been repeated over and over again, and I will try not to repeat it over and over again. <laughs> Are we chosen for these experiences or do they happen randomly? And my question has to do with, is this phenomenon, do you believe, a portent of changes that are happening in our overall consciousness and that these kinds of experiences will be more available to people without having to nearly quote unquote die? Are these experiences portents of things, do you have, do you have to nearly die to have them? with string theory and other things? Um, yes, someone um, suggested this already, but can you talk about how other altered states of consciousness, um, for example, in psychiatry, you know, light experiences and bipolar mm -hmm. type, you know, experiences, what's the connection as far as right. you The connection to other experiences, including uh, mental illness. Yeah. I would be interested in your personal experience of what was it in your experience that brought be able to talk about that. Yeah. Now, I know that Dr. George Ritchie may be a few years older than you, but he being a psychiatrist also, and I think out of the Virginia, has you right. crossed paths with him. Oh, yes. Could you, could you share that in conference? Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Physiology of shutting down and discount the spiritual. Yes, I'll talk about that. Uh, I've heard people who've had made up experiences talk about the uh, inter interconnectedness of all being, how everything is connected. And um, I'd like to hear you speak about how that awareness may lead to a, a life of, of more compassion. Okay, how does the interconnectedness that people report lead to a life of compassion? All right, we're going to be here for about several hours. <laughs> experiences uh, then affect what they perceive in their near death. Like the life experiences before the NDE? Right, or like their, their, their life experience, their religious background, their belief systems, the paradigms that they believe. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you asked a lot of good questions here. other questions as they come up during the presentation. And if you come up with questions after I leave here, this is how you can reach me. Uh, you've asked a lot of questions about things that is very difficult for science to address. Questions about consciousness, questions about love, about interconnectedness, uh, about spirituality, about whether we survive, whether there's an afterlife. These are things that science has a very, very difficult time addressing. It's not impossible. And I will hopefully tell you a little bit how we can do it. But they're not science's strong point. Uh, there are a number of mysteries that science cannot address, such as why UVA grads are called Wahoos. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking to you essentially as a scientist. So you will hear some things from me that you may think, uh, why are we spending time on these basic things that we all know? Um, well, you who are experiencers know things because you've experienced them. But scientists know things because they have studied them. They come up with what they think is evidence of it. I'm going to try to bridge that gap for you. I'd like to start with an overview of some of the recent research findings we have had. But first, let me say a few more words about research. There are different types of research. There's no one way to do it. Um, and a lot of, in fact, a lot of what scientists do ends up being trying something and seeing if it works. <laughs> Thank you. 
And sometimes you have to try many things before you finally find something that works for you. <laughs> but in behavioral research, which is all research that deals with human beings essentially, there are two strategies in general you can use. Uh, they can be prospective or retrospective. Prospective, which literally means looking forward. And retrospective means looking backward. <coughs> Prospective studies carry a lot more weight with scientists because they allow the researcher to control, or at least to monitor, the important variables as they're occurring. So we try to do prospective research, but that type of research is very expensive and very time consuming, very intensive. It's much easier to do retrospective research where you can look backwards on something that's already happened. It's cheap to do, it's easier to do, the problem is you don't have control over some of the important variables. You may not even know what some of the important variables are. So you have to make compromises. How does this refer, uh, apply to near-death research? Well, to do prospective studies of near-death research, you have to identify people who are going to have an NDE <laughs> and study them, and then watch them go through the NDE important <coughs> variables, and then they change. As you can imagine, that would be hard to do. Not impossible. And I will tell you about some research we've done like that. But it's expensive, it's time intensive, and difficult. With very, very few exceptions, almost all NDE research has been retrospective, which means you start with people who have had an NDE in the past, and you try to reconstruct what they went through, what has happened, how it's changed them. That's much easier to do than prospective research. But it leaves open a lot of unanswered questions. And one of the most prominent ones that critics will tell us over and over again is the major question of our faulty memories. When you're starting with someone's memory of what happened, trying to reconstruct it, how do you know how reliable those memories are? We know from research with post-traumatic stress disorder that strong emotion may make memories even less reliable. And many near-death experiences will say that the NDE was the most emotional thing in their life. So wouldn't that make NDE memories even less reliable than anything else? Many skeptics have claimed that NDEs, or the accounts of NDEs, are embellished over time and they get better and better each time they hear the story being told. And specifically that the blissful nature of the NTE is exaggerated over time. That's what the skeptics say, but as Sigmund Freud warned us, if you regard yourself as a skeptic, it's good to have occasional doubts about your skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> the belief that NDEs are exaggerated over time is an assumption that's taken for granted by many skeptics, but there's not one shred of evidence to support it. It's a plausible hypothesis, and it's a testable one. Because most of what we know about NDEs is based on retrospective recollections, it's important to know how reliable they are. And because I've been doing this research for three decades now, I'm able to answer this question. Back in the early 1980s, I did some research out of which I developed a near-death experience scale. I took a, a series of more than 80 things near-death experiences repeatedly told me. And I made a scale out of them <laughs> and gave it to more than 100 experiencers. And through various statistical maneuvers I'm going to do with you, we whittled, whittled it down to 32 and then to 16 items which formed a core near-death experience. And I published that in 1983. Let me just show you briefly what those are. We found that the NDE can be thought of as having these four different components. A cognitive component involving changes in the way your thinking is going on. An affective component involving changes in your emotional state. What we call the paranormal component, which was anomalous things that are happening to you on what appears to be this earth plane, and finally a transcendental which appeared to be going to some other realm or dimension.
dimension of existence. The cognitive component with changes in thought processes involves thought distortion. People often say there was no there was no time in the other world, or time stopped or ceased to exist. Thoughts becoming much faster than they usually are. And they also say that thoughts are clearer and more logical than usual. A life review or panoramic memory where someone's <laughs> entire life can pass before their eyes. And a sense of sudden understanding of everything. These are all part of the cognitive component. The affective one includes overwhelming senses of peace and joy. A sense of being one with everything, so-called cosmic unity. And the encounter with the being of light. And this falls under the affective component because it's not just seeing a light. It's experiencing the unconditional love that comes from this light. The paranormal component including, includes extraordinary senses. People say that their hearing, their vision, are much more acute than they ever were before. They see colors they never saw before. They hear sounds they never heard before. It also includes what they describe as extrasensory perception, being aware of things that are outside the range of their senses. It includes visions of the future, of their own personal future, and sometimes of the planet's future. And it includes an out-of-body experience, feeling like you are leaving your physical body and viewing it from a different perspective. The transcendental component involves a sense of leaving the earthly plane and going to some mystical or unearthly realm, encountering some mystical being or presence, actually seeing deceased spirits or religious spirits and coming to a border or point of no return beyond which you can't pass and still come back to life. <coughs> this work was all done in the early 80s. In 2002, I tracked down people who had filled out this questionnaire for me 20 years earlier. Now many of those people had passed away between 1980 and 2002. There were 115 who I could not confirm had died. And of those, I was able to track down and find 72, which was 63% of the original sample. I sent each one of those my near-death experience scale again, without reminding them that they did it 20 years ago. Now, it's possible that they had been reading it over again every day for the past 20 years. <laughs> but not one of them expressed any sense that they had seen the scale before. So I'm pretty confident that for most of them, they didn't know they were doing something they had done before. And I compared their scores on the NDE scale they did 20 years ago with the one they did now in the 21st century. And here's what we found. In the NDE scale in general, the mean score in 1980 was 14.6 and 2014.2. The column on the far right is the statistical significance. NS means not significant. There's essentially no change in their overall scores. If you look at the scores for each of the four individual components, cognitive, affective, paranormal, transcendental, there was no significant difference. There was no exaggeration over time of these experiences. In fact, there's a slight decrease, particularly of the affective component. People said, the skeptic said, people exaggerate the pleasantness of it. In fact, they don't. It seems to be slightly less pleasant over time, although, again, not statistically significant. Basically, there's no difference between what they said 20 years ago and what they said now. What this means is that NDE memories are reliable. They don't change over time. And that means that retrospective research is also valid. That you can take people now who had the experience 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And when they say, it's like I had it yesterday, and tell you about it, that's the same thing they would have told you 30 years ago when they had it. The memories do not change. Another important question that the skeptics bring up is, OK, so maybe these are reliable experiences. But aren't they just people telling us what they expected to see when they came close to death? Aren't all these things just culturally conditioned 
what you think is going to happen. That's a little harder to test. And in fact, there are cross-cultural differences in the way people describe NDEs. What they describe may not be different, <clears throat> but how they describe it differs from culture to culture. For example, people all over the world and throughout the centuries have described a warm, loving being of God who comes to greet them. If you talk to people in Virginia who tend to be Southern Baptists, they may say, I saw Christ manifesting as this warm, loving being of light. If you talk to Hindus, they may say, I saw a Yandu, a messenger from the God of uh, death. People may say, I saw my deceased grandmother who appeared as a being of light. They're all describing the same thing, but they're putting their cultural construct on it. So they may describe it in different words, but it's the same thing. People all over the world describe something like a tunnel. A lot's been made by skeptics by the, by the fact that people in third world countries don't talk about tunnels. Well, they don't have a lot of tunnels. They talk about caves, about wells, about funnels. One truck driver that I interviewed talked about being sucked into a tailpipe. <laughs> but they're all describing the same thing. So how do you test this hypothesis scientifically? That our accounts of NDEs are being colored by our cultural expectations. The cultural model we have here in the United States for the past 30 years has been Raymond Moody's model. Raymond Moody was the medical student who wrote a book called Life After Life in 1975 that named this phenomenon. There have been reports of it for centuries. There are even accounts in the medical literature going back hundreds of years. But no one had a name for it. But Raymond put a name for it and gave us a model of what it was supposed to look like. And this is what you often hear about. Oh, this is more of the Back to the 20 years apart studies. I showed you a slide showing that the memories were the same 20 years apart. What this shows is a correlation of the change in the score with the elapsed time. Some of these people I interviewed, I, I sent the questionnaire to, I filled it out 17 years ago, some 24 years ago. And this correlates the amount of years between the two administrations of the test, the change in the score. And there's no significant difference. That means if you wait longer, just them again, it doesn't make the changes any less reliable. Okay, back to Moody. Moody described this as the NDE, a sense of ineffability. There are no words to express it. Hearing yourself pronounced dead. Feelings of peace. Hearing unusual noises, music or rushing or ringing sound. Seeing the tunnel. Being out of the body, meeting spiritual beings. Encountering the bright light or the being of light. The light for you realm where all knowledge exists, cities of light, realms of bewildered spirits, supernatural rescue being brought back to life, coming to that border or limit, coming back into the body. He also added, after effects, of feeling frustrated by trying to tell other people about the NDE, having your own vision of life being broadened or deepened, total elimination of your fear of death, and having other people corroborate your out-of-body visions. So this is the Moody model. Does this affect what we hear people talk about when they describe their NDEs? Jeff and Jody Law, who have a wonderful website, the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation website, nderf.org, did a survey of, through their website where people can post their near-death experiences. And they looked at experiences that occurred before 1975 when Raymond wrote this book. And reports at the NDEs that occurred afterwards. And they found no difference. However, the skeptics say, even though these NDEs were report, reported to have occurred before Raymond wrote his book, they were put up on the website just in the last few years. They weren't reported until the year 2000. So even though the experiences may have happened a long time ago, the accounts can still be colored by Raymond Moody's model. So you really need to look at accounts that were reported to the researchers before 1975. And I have about two dozen of those. At the University of Virginia where I work, you can click
collecting these stories for a long, long time. We didn't have a name for them before 1975, so they weren't called NDEs. But people wrote to us because of our research and said, I had this out-of-body experience when I came close to death, or my life flashed before my eyes, or something else. Something else that we now call an NDE. So we looked at these 24 experiences that were reported to us between 1960 and 1970, before Raymond wrote his book in 1975. And we selected the 24 most recent cases we had in the last few years that matched the original sample in terms of age, sex, religious background, the way they came close to death, and a few other related variables. And we looked at Raymond's elements. Now, not all of the elements that Raymond described were in are included in our um, in our accounts from the 1960s. We didn't know to ask about some of these things. But many of them we did. In the left-hand column are the percentage of people before Raymond wrote his book who described this phenomenon to us. And on the right are the ones who reported them in the last few years. And as you can see, for the majority of these, there is no significant difference. The sense of ineffability is reported slightly more often now. People didn't know to talk about that back then. But the difference was not significant. Hearing yourself pronounced dead, having a feeling of peace, hearing unusual noises, all the same before and after. The tunnel was different. We're hearing more tunnels now than we did before. What do we make of that? Well, several people, long before we did this research, had written that the tunnel is not part of the NDE. Kevin Drab, a researcher, wrote back in 1980 that the, NDE, that the tunnel is a secondary hallucination that we make up to try to explain how do you get from this earthly life to this other realm. I'm here, now I'm there. How do I get there? So your mind constructs this tunnel. An Indian researcher named C.T.K. Chari wrote back in 1982 about tunnel experiences in a wide variety of phenomena, not just NDEs. And in fact, when I developed my NDE scale, the tunnel wasn't on that. Because when we did the statistical analyses, tunnels were not statistically correlated with all the other phenomena that we talked about. So there's a lot of evidence before we even did this study that the tunnel is not an essential part of the NDE. These other things have not changed at all from before and after Raymond wrote his book. But the tunnel is reported more commonly now. The other things Raymond mentioned, again, the same before and after. The OBE, meeting others, seeing the being of light, having a life review, coming to the border. <laughs> Difficulty telling others. Look at this, attitude changes. 100% before and after. Losing your fear of death, belief in survival after death, and corroboration of your out-of-body visions. All the same before and after Raymond wrote his book. So this is defendable evidence that our cultural models do not influence what we report as NDEs. So we know now that NDE reports are reliable and that they're not influenced by cultural expectations. So what are they related to? Let me take a sidetrack now. We often hear about the after effects of near-death experiences as being very positive. People are more, are more altruistic, more loving, more connected to other people. They try to lead their life in a loving way. And it sounds wonderful. Is life after an NGE totally wonderful? Well, you know it's not. People have problems after an NGE. They have problems within themselves because they're all, their beliefs and values and attitudes have now been altered. And that's difficult for a lot of people to have your whole world turned upside down. Some people have doubts about their sanity after having an NGE. They are paralyzed by fear of being rejected or ridiculed by people if they try to talk about these things. And some people feel angry about having been brought back or sent back. 
Some people stay depressed because they didn't want to come back from that other world. In addition to these problems within yourself, people often have problems with others. They feel alienated from people who haven't had the NDE because they can't communicate what's the most important thing in their life. They have difficulty going back to their previous roles in life. Now, for some people, this isn't a problem. One of the most dramatic stories was a fellow who was a bag man for the Mafia, who was shot in the chest and left for dead and had a beautiful near-death experience. And when he came out of that, he just couldn't go back to that life of crime. I thought, in my naive uh, way, that once you're in the Mafia, you don't get out. In fact, that's not true at all. They were happy to let him go. <laughs> I actually talked to his girlfriend as well. I should say his ex-girlfriend. And she complained to me bitterly that Rocky has no interest anymore in things of substance. <laughs> he now makes his living counseling spouse abusers. So we have problems coming back. Difficulty communicating the experience. Some people come back saying, after I've experienced the divine love from God, how can I be satisfied with the conditional human love? And it really makes it impossible for them to feel relating to other people. So you have all these problems after an NDE. You have all these problems after an experience that sounds crazy. Are we really talking about mental illness here? Some people have written about the similarities between NDEs and mental illness, particularly what we call dissociation, post-traumatic stress, or PTSD, and psychosis. Dissociation is a way of separating off a part of your life that's difficult to deal with. And the typical example is when you're in a crisis situation, uh, such as being attacked, being assaulted, and you separate from yourself, and distance yourself from the body that's being assaulted, and you sort of block out that memory. You either forget the memory, or it becomes unemotional for you. But we all dissociate all the time in daily life. When you're engaged in athletic activity, and you don't notice that you've gotten injured, and you don't feel the pain, that's dissociation. After the game is over, you suddenly feel the pain. You stop dissociating. When you're driving down a highway, you don't realize you just missed your exit. You've dissociated. You're blocking off a part of your perception, a part of your, your mental life. Okay, so we have these things that look to people like mental illness. Are they really mental illness? Imagine you know what a dog is, but you've never seen a cat. So you know dogs, they have four legs, they eat from a dish, they like to be petted, they're furry. And I show you a cat. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a dog. He said, no, it's not a dog. It's different. And you say, no, no, it's got four legs, eats from a dish, likes to be petted, it's furry. That's what a dog is. So you say, no, there are some differences. I know there are some similarities. Dogs and cats do share some traits. But if you look at the whole phenomenon, dogs bark. Cats don't bark, they meow. Dogs wag their tail. Cats don't do that, they purr. Dogs tend to travel in packs. Cats tend to travel alone. Dogs pant, and so forth. And you can go on and on. If you look at just, just the area over, overlap, you can say, oh yeah, they're the same. They're both the same. They're both four-legged furry animals. If you look at the whole animal, it's clear they're different things. It's the same way with NDEs and mental illness. If you look just at the area of overlap, you say, yeah, they're both crazy. They both see things, they have strange beliefs, their roles are changed, this is mental illness. But there are other aspects of the phenomenon that are vastly different. NDEers tend to be very joyful after their experience. Most people with mental illness are not joyful. They tend to be fearful and depressed. If you give people with mental illness drugs, they may get better. That doesn't happen with NDEers. They have no response to medications. People who are mentally ill tend to be more self-absorbed because of the illness. 
whereas people with NDEs tend to be less self-absorbed and more altruistic. And you can go on and on. If you look at just the overlap in the middle, they look like the same thing. If you look at the whole phenomenon, they're very different. So I looked at the whole phenomenon, and here's the story on dissociation. This is a standard scale of dissociative experiences. The bar on the left, column on the left, are patients with a dissociative disorder, a psychiatric diagnosis. And on this particular scale, they third scored an average of 30 points. In the middle are the ND years, and on the right are people who are close to death without an NDE. And they are both vastly lower than the patients were. So we're not dealing with mental illness here. Now the ND years do have slightly more dissociation than the non-ND years. But it's not out of the range of normality. In fact, the rate you see here among ND years is the mean value you see among normal adolescents. So what this may mean is that something about the NDE puts you back in the mind state of when you were an adolescent. We also looked at post-traumatic stress disorder. And using the standard scale of PTSD, again, the bar on the left are patients with PTSD, in the middle are NDEers, and on the right are people who have come close to death but didn't have an NDE. Again, the NDEers are nowhere near the number of symptoms that you have in PTSD. But they are much higher than the, their, than the people who have come close to death but didn't have an NDE. Let me tell you a little about PTSD. There are two types of symptoms in PTSD, intrusion and avoidance. And both of them occur in PTSD. Intrusion are intrusive thoughts, reminders about the event. You keep dreaming about it, you keep thinking about it, without meaning to. You have strong waves of emotion about it. Pictures keep popping into your mind and so forth. These are the intrusive symptoms. Those so of you who have had NDEs, do you have intrusive symptoms? Here's the avoidance symptoms for PTSD. They try hard to avoid any reminders of the event. They won't go to the place where it happened. They try to remove it from their memory. They feel numb about it. They try to avoid any encounter with it and feel as if it never really happened. Well, if you look at the near-death experiencers, you see here, first on the left, are patients with PTSD with high rates of intrusion in the light color and avoidance in the dark color. In those who are close to death without NDEs, low rates of both. In the NDEers, you see a fair amount of intrusion and no more avoidance than people who didn't have NDEs. So what this says is that NDEers may have some intrusion. They may think about the NDE very often, but they don't try to avoid it the way people with PTSD do. So there may be some things about NDEs that have some similarity to PTSD in that sense that you keep replaying it over and over in your mind, trying to make sense of it. But it doesn't have the same symptom profile that PTSD has. How about the psychotic diagnosis? This is a difficult one because when, uh, when a patient tells a doctor things that don't make sense to the doctor, the doctor has to make a determination, is this person crazy or not? And it's often very difficult when the patient's worldview and the doctor's worldview don't match to decide which one really has a better view of reality. <laughs> it shows the doctor using a goose as a stethoscope and saying, one of us, Mr. Barrows, is a very sick man. So which one is crazy? <laughs> we did a study which some of you I know have participated in. Uh, Mitch Leister, who's a Colorado psychiatrist, and I sent surveys around to various uh, friends of mine groups all over the country and asked about near-death experiences who continue to hear voices after the experience is over. And we found that a fair number of them did. And then we sent them a questionnaire which is the same questionnaire that's been sent to people with schizophrenia and other psychotic mental illnesses. And it asked about a wide variety of attitudes towards their hallucinations, towards their 
voices, their inner voices. And what we found was very striking, that both the schizophrenics and the near-death experiencers heard some type of inner voice. Among the end ears, on the left, about 85% wanted to keep hearing the voice, especially if they could control it. In the dark bars of the schizophrenics, only 10% said they wanted to keep hearing the voice. And this was a typical pattern in all the questions on the questionnaire. The end ears saw their, their inner voices, their quote, hallucinations, as being helpful. The schizophrenics saw them as being persecutory. We're not talking about the same phenomenon here. We also did a study looking at all people who came into a psychiatric clinic and gave them a standard scale called the SCL90, Symptom Checklist 90, which looks at psychological distress in a variety of ways. And this is a graph showing only the patients in the psychiatric clinic who had come close to death, which ended up being about half of them. The bars in the light colors are those who had near-death experiences, and the dark colors are those who didn't have the near-death experience. And for every single area of psychological distress, those who had an NDE had less distress than people who came close to death but didn't have an NDE. So no matter what brought them to the clinic, no matter what their symptoms were, they were feeling less distressed if they had an NDE than if they didn't. So this is one argument against the NDE being a type of mental illness, which you would think would increase their distress. One of the things the skeptics say to us is, it's dangerous to talk about NDEs, because you're saying death is blissful, less is wonderful, it's a reunion with deceased loved ones, it's being back with God, you're going to make people suicidal. <laughs> well, we did a series of studies of people who were suicidal and made suicide attempts. And as a result of that attempt, had a near-death experience. And we compared them with people who were in the same situation but didn't have an NDE as a result of the suicide attempt. And we found that those who had an NDE were much less suicidal afterwards than those who didn't have an NDE. We asked them why, and the number of answers we got was about equal to the number of patients we asked. But there were some general categories. The most common thing they said, these were listed in the order of frequency, the most common thing they said was that, now I feel I'm part of something greater than myself. They also said that my personal losses and failures don't mean as much to me as they did before the NDE. Put them in a better perspective now. They said that I have a better sense of meaning in life now. That before I committed suicide, before I attempted suicide, life had no meaning. Now it's got meaning for me. In that context, I can put up with all the stuff I was going through before. They felt more alive now than they had before. They had more self-esteem than they did before. And they felt more compassion for others, which also meant they had more compassion for themselves. These are all things people reported to us as reasons why they were no longer suicidal after the NDE. So one more reason why I would argue that these NDEs are not like mental illness. As a psychiatrist, what's interested me most about the NDE has been the after effects. And there have been many, many studies of this because it's the easiest thing to study. It's hard to actually study the experience itself. It's easy to study how people have changed. And study after study has shown the same thing. That certain things are reliably increased after an NDE. People's sense of spirituality, their concern and compassion for others, their appreciation for life, their sense of meaning in life, a sense of purpose are increased. Their flexibility in being able to cope with stressors and their belief that they're going to survive death. These are all increased. At the same time, there are certain things that are reliably decreased. <clears throat> and number one on that list is their fear of death. No matter how they came close to death, whether they've had a pleasant or an unpleasant NDE, they're usually less frightened of death after the experience. Now, are people who aren't NDEers afraid of death? Some people 
people will say yes, some people will say no, I'm not afraid of death. But I think Woody Allen said it best when he said, I'm not afraid of that, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> Things that are decreased reliably after a near-death experience are the fear of death, the interest in material possessions, the interest in personal status, competitiveness. Now, this doesn't mean that people who have an NDE can't appreciate good material things. They do. But they aren't invested in them. They don't identify with them. They can appreciate having nice clothes, a fancy car, but if they lose them tomorrow, that's fine too. It's not like they're defining themselves by their possessions. <clears throat> Kenneth Rain developed a scale to measure the changes in after effects. And on this scale of rings, plus two is the most extreme positive change you can have. And it went down to a minus two on the bottom. And he found that in virtually every area, there were significant changes after the NDE. Starting from the left, their attitudes towards death, spirituality, life, that sense of meaning, caring about others, caring about yourself. And then the last three on the right were social issues, religion, and feelings about the world, the material world. We did a correlation of the changes in these attitudes with the depth of the NDE strength of the NDE, which was basically how high you scored on my NDE scale. And what we found was that in almost every area, the deeper the NDE, the higher your score on the NDE scale, the more significant the changes were. Uh, these R values over here are the correlation. Basically, you need 0.3 to get a significant correlation. And these are all far above that. The farthest on the right is the p value. This basically means 0.01 means the odds are 1,001 that this is not uh, happening by chance. So these are extremely significant. The whole step, the whole life changes score, attitudes for spirituality, death, meaning, life attitudes, all highly significant. The same holds true for concern for others, self acceptance, and concern about. Worldly achievement. This was a negative correlation, minus 0.305. So the deeper the NDE, the less you are concerned about worldly things. Religiousness was not correlated with the depth of the NDE, changes in religiosity. And concern about social and global issues was also not. How about spirituality? That's a little more difficult for science to study. But there have now been some scales looking at changes in spirituality. We just ask people point blank. You know, well, one more thing about Ken's scale. What, what you see from this is that almost anything you ask about, people will say, yes, my attitudes have changed. And one way to look at this is that what's changed is people's concept of how they relate to the universe. And if that's changed, then everything else is going to change as well. And one the end of the year told me it's kind of like this. People in a snowstorm want to say, how do we know we're not inside someone's paperweight? <laughs> it makes you question the basic assumptions about the world we're living in. So we ask people about changes in their religious or spiritual beliefs and practices as a result of the NDE. The first column are changes in religious and spiritual beliefs. And almost 80% said they were changed after the NDE. The second column is religious and spiritual practices, and almost 70%. The third was belief in survival after death. Even more people said that. On the far right was their uh, interest or their exposure to occult things after the NDE. And only about half, less than half, about 40%, said that had, had changed. But there were marked changes in religious and spiritual belief and practices. Again, we looked at the correlation between these factors and the depth of the NDE and found that there were very high correlations between religious and spiritual beliefs changing and practices changing. Um, 
this change column is the NDE scale score of people who said, yes, my attitudes have changed. And the no change score was the NDE scale score for people who said, no, they haven't changed. And the NDE was deeper or stronger in people who said they had had changes in spiritual beliefs and practices, and also people who said their uh, belief in survival had changed. We also looked at a, a scale of well-beings, and this is something that's been a standard scale used by psychologists for years now. And it looks at spiritual well-being and religious well-being. Religious well-being essentially dealt with your relationship to God. And spiritual well-being had no questions about God at all. It's just talking about your relationship to the universe, uh, towards the divine. And both were highly correlated with the depth of the NDE. A number of the questions you asked dealt with the question of love. And that's even harder for scientists to deal with. But there are some people now who are developing scales to measure compassionate love, as opposed to romantic love, erotic love, motherly love. This is compassionate love for everyone. And I gave one of the most recently developed scales to the NDE years and correlated again with the depth of the NDE. And again, very high correlations between the depth of your NDE and how much compassionate love you felt for other people how much you cared about what was happening to other people, your acceptance and tolerance for them, and your willingness to sacrifice for them. Confirmation that people after an NDE really do become more compassionate, more loving, more altruistic. One of the problems with all this research is that it is retrospective. I'm looking at people who have already had an NDE, saying, Tell me how you've changed. If I give people these scales before the NDE, what I've got the same findings. What I found that people who later had NDEs actually started out being more compassionate to begin with. People tell me that's not the case. And in fact, we've also had NDE or significant others fill out questionnaires. And they also report that's a different person now. But the only way to really answer this question is to do a prospective study before and after. To look at people before the NDE and after the NDE. How do you do that? You need people who are going to come close to death. We've thought about all sorts of ways of doing this, talking to people on death row, that kind of thing. It's hard to interview them afterwards, though. <laughs> Cardiac Electrophysiology Clinic at my hospital. And this is a lab where they study the heart electricity of people who are having serious heart disease. And I looked at one particular procedure in which they implanted surgically in someone's chest a defibrillator. They do this for people who are having repeated episodes of what they call sudden cardiac death, repeated cardiac arrests. These people are tried on drugs, they're tried on pacemakers, and it doesn't work. They keep having these sudden death episodes. So they implant in this person's chest a device with electrodes going into the heart that will constantly monitor the heart. So you have a constant readout of the heart rhythm. And as long as your heart is beating perfectly fine, it does nothing but monitor it. If your heart goes into cardiac arrest, it will pick up that fact, make the diagnosis, and it will shock you back into a normal sinus rhythm. So it's like having the defibrillation paddles right there on your chest all the time. And if you go into cardiac arrest, it'll shock you back out. Well, when they put this device in, how do they know whether it's going to work or not? They have to test it by intentionally inducing cardiac arrest and then watching to see whether it works. So we have a situation where I know exactly when someone's going to be put in cardiac arrest. If they have an NDE then, well, I can study them before the procedure and after. I had done a study in this hospital previously of everyone admitted to the hospital with a cardiac arrest. 
And I found that about 10% of them described typical near-death experiences to me. So I thought, great, if I get just 10% of these people who have induced cardiac arrests, that'll be great. Here's the setup. You see, in this case, the two cardiac surgeons here and the anesthesiologist on the right, and the patient is in the middle um, under a sterile curtain. Above the patient is basically a portable x-ray machine um, that helps the doctor see where the electrodes are when they're really in the right portion of the heart. So I put on top of that device, which is about 10 feet in the air, a target. And a lot of people who have near-death experience will say, I was out of my body, I was looking down at the whole thing, I saw the doctors do this, and I saw the doctors do that. And sometimes they tell us some very unusual and accurate things. But it's hard to assess uh, the reliability or the, uh, the unexpectedness of those accounts. If they say, well, I saw my doctor scratch his elbow. Well, is that unusual or not? You know, how do you assess that? So if we plant a target up there, and we know what the odds are of guessing what that target is, then you can assess if someone says, yes, I was out of my body, and I saw the doctor do this and that, and I saw your target and described it for us. We know what the odds are. In this particular case, what we put up there was an Apple laptop computer facing up towards the ceiling. And when we were about to put the patient into cardiac arrest, I turned it on, and it would choose one of 12 different animations in one of five different bright colors. So you had a chance of one out of 60 of guessing the target correct, if you knew it was up there even. And it would run continuously, occasionally being interrupted by the time, so it gets anchored in time. And I thought, great, if people are having an NDE here, and they tell us, yes, I happen to see the doctors doing this and doctors doing that, I also saw a purple frog jumping around on this computer screen. That would be pretty impressive. <laughs> so, when these people come into the hospital for this procedure, the day before the procedure, I spend about two hours with them, interviewing them, getting all sorts of psychological testing, looking at their attitudes, their beliefs, their values, their concepts of life and death, their religion, religiosity, their spirituality. And then they undergo this procedure. And then the next day, I talk to them again. And I ask them what they remember about the procedure. And I hope for them to say, yes, I saw this blue horse running around on this. <laughs> and then I give them again in nine months and give them the same psychological tests again to see whether they're changed. So what happened? Well, what happened was that not a single patient reported an out-of-body experience. Not a single patient reported a near-death experience. In fact, most of them said, I remember nothing. Would you think that if they're doing this, they're obviously not going to let the person stay in that state for very long at all. So they may not have experienced much. Right. And that's one of my excuses. <laughs> I've come up with three excuses why this didn't work. One was, as you just suggested, this device works pretty well. So most people are in cardiac arrest for about four to eight seconds before the device realizes what's going on and shocks them out of it. And we know from lots of studies that it takes about 10 seconds of cardiac arrest before you get brainwave changes suggesting something going on in the brain. So maybe this isn't long enough for to have an NDE. Well, I also know lots, lots of NDEers who didn't have 20 seconds or 10 seconds of, of cardiac arrest. I know someone who didn't have any people who weren't in cardiac arrest but had an NDE. So that's not the whole answer. Another thing is that all of these patients, you know, they, these are compassionate doctors. It's not pleasant to be put into cardiac arrest to be shot down. So they give people a sedative beforehand that blocks their memory so that they won't remember afterwards. Well, that's another excuse. If you've been given this drug, how can you possibly remember what happened afterwards? 
Well, I do know people who have had NDEs after being given these drugs. So that's not the whole answer either. One more answer, one more excuse is that these patients are all heavily reassured by the cardiologist beforehand that nothing's going to happen to them. They're constantly monitored. There's not going to be any danger. There's not going to be any, any near-death event here. We're watching you very closely. We're not going to let anything happen to you. So you've got drugs that stop them from remembering. You've got a very, very short cardiac arrest. And you've got no expectation of coming close to death. And all three of those things are working against us finding the NDE. Was that a failure? Um, not really. You know, I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> I got the cardiologist very excited. Now they're all wearing funny things on their hats. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned how not to design the study next time. Uh, I should mention that I'm now part of a multinational consortium that's working up a grant to study a different type of procedure where people are being put into a more serious condition than this. And this consortium involves some of the names you may have heard before. Peter Fenwick from England, Sam Parney from England, who's now in New York, uh, Mario Beauregard from Montreal, um, Pim Van Lummel from Holland, Sylvie Filias from, uh, from Switzerland, a multinational group. And what we're looking at is not this procedure, but what's called the hypothermic circulatory arrest. If you know the story of Pam Reynolds, written by Mike Sabov, she had a these procedures. It's basically a procedure in which we drain all the blood out of a person's body. So there's no question about getting out of good blood to the brain. And this is done in very unusual circumstances when you have such, for example, a, an aneurysm, a ballooning out of the blood vessel of the brain that can't be safely operated on as long as their blood's going through the vessel because you may risk bursting the blood for the vessel and, and killing them instantly. So they drain all the blood out of the body first. No way. And then it takes about 45 to 60 minutes to do the procedure. So you have somebody who meets all our criteria for death for almost an hour during this procedure. Their brain waves are being monitored. They also have, in addition to the surface EEG, they have depth electrodes put into the base of the brain so that we're sure there's no brain activity going on. These people have no heartbeat. No respiratory rate and no brain waves for 45 to 60 minutes. That's as dead as people get without uh, being there permanently. And the one person we know about who had an NDE with us, uh, I met with Pat Reynolds, had a very elaborate experience where she described in detail a lot of things going on in the operating room, including some mistakes that were made that she was able to talk about. She reported conversations people made. She reported insensitive things people had done in the operating room. And she also had reunion with, reunion with deceased loved ones and being a black and so forth. A very elaborate experience um, um, after being dead for about an hour. So we're about to do that study now. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to talk about one more thing that several of you mentioned before. You said that you were here because you're interested in the afterlife and the question of whether we survive. And this is an area that is very difficult for science to deal with, but not impossible. The sense you get from many near-death experiencers is that death is not an end, that death is a change of state. And I'm indebted to another end here for giving me this next slide, which shows death as a change of state. <laughs> scientifically? Well, a lot of people will say, no, it's not measurable. You can't study unmeasurable things. Science is a tool for studying the physical world. Well, scientists study a lot of things that are not physically detectable. We study emotions. We study love. We study hate. We study sadness. How can you study them if you can't directly feel them or see them or hear them? You can do this because emotions leave physically 
uh, detectable traces. And you can measure those behavioral traces. And therefore make inferences about the emotions. This is not peculiar to psychiatry or psychology. In physics, you produce elementary particles, subatomic particles, that are in existence for such a short period of time, they're so small that you can't detect them. So what we will typically do is shoot these particles through some type of liquid that will leave a bubble trail as they pass through it. And you can see the behavioral traces of where this particle has been. And here's a picture of particles, of the, sorry, the bubble trails being left behind in particles sent through liquid xenon. You never see the particles. We don't know that they exist. We assume they exist because we plan to produce them. And we have behavioral evidence from which we infer their existence, their properties, their charge, their size, their paths. So it's well established in science that you can study things you can't see by looking at their effects. So this is how we approach things like survival. And we study the effects of survival. Well, there are different types of evidence that bear on the question of whether we survive death of the body. There's evidence that people who are now living may have lived before. If that's the case, then obviously there's some type of survival. There's evidence that some people who are now dead are still around and existing in some form. Then there's a third type of evidence, that the mind can function independent of the brain. Now that by itself does not prove that we survive death, but it makes it more plausible. If the mind can function without the brain, then maybe it can do that after the brain is dead. So what is the evidence here? The evidence that people who are now living have lived before, we have people who have verifiable memories of a past life. We have at the University of Virginia 2,700 cases of children between the ages of two and five who spontaneously have talked about a past life. And many of them give us names and places that we can verify, things that they couldn't possibly have known by any normal means. Many of these children also not just have the, the memories, but have personality traits of the person they claim to be in a past life. They have likes and dislikes of the person of the past life. A lot of this work is done in India. A lot of it is done in countries where there's a belief in reincarnation. Because if a child here talks about a past life, the parents say, shut up and eat your peace, stop talking about that. In India, they don't tend to suppress this. They let the child talk about it. And you see children talking about things that the parents don't want to hear sometimes. We have, for example, children born to a Hindu family who won't eat their parents' food because they claim they were Muslim in their past life and want their food prepared by a Muslim. You see people in Sri Lanka who are in one ethnic group and speak the Tamil language of another ethnic group that their family doesn't speak and they were never taught it, but they can speak it. You have likes and dislikes, you have personality traits, you have unlearned skills that they all relate to a past life. You also have, in some of these cases, birthmarks and birth defects that are attributed to the previous life. We have many cases now of children who have birthmarks, and we have the autopsy reports of the person they claim to have been. And we can match up the wounds that caused the death with birthmarks on a child. We have some very bizarre birthmarks and birth defects as well. We have people who have fingers missing that correspond to fingers that were chopped off in the previous life. We have one child in Burma, who's now in Myanmar, who had a very unusual constriction around one leg. It was in a spiral going all the way down his leg. I've never seen anything like this before. There's no embryological explanation for how this can happen to a person. And this child remembered a life as a British flyer during World War II who was shot down by the Japanese. And he bailed out of his plane, and the chute, the, the ropes got tied around his leg and didn't open. And he claimed that these, this spiral Constriction around his leg was where the ropes had found his leg. Hard to explain this. Okay, so these are the evidences that people now living have lived before. <coughs> How about the evidence that people who are now dead are still living? We have people who see apparitions of the dead. These can be spontaneous, or as you heard Alan Bodkin talk, they can be induced. You can 
induce in various ways apparitions of the deceased. You can communicate through mediums, people who seem to have a particular talent at communicating with the deceased. You have what's now called <coughs> instrumental transcommunication, used to be called EVP, electronic voice phenomena. There are some situations in which the deceased seem to communicate through electronic instruments, computers, <coughs> telephones, now computers. And you have people who plan to leave evidence for life after death. A lot of the early researchers in this field, in England back in the um, turn of the last century, left encoded messages and said, after I die, I am going to send you the code to break this message. That turned out not to be a very good plan because <laughs> many programs, many computer programs now can decode messages very easily. We've got that modified here <clears throat> now. We have combination locks that you can set yourself. If you want to participate in this research, we have you get one of these locks, make up a combination for it, try to remember what it is, <laughs> and then set the combination. And don't write it down anywhere so there's no record of what the combination is. And then leave us some information about how you plan to communicate the combination after you die. And we have about 30 of these so far. Unfortunately, for about five or six of the people who already told us, still alive. I can't remember the combination of <laughs> We still have about two dozen uh, that we're still waiting for. Okay, so we have evidence that people who are now alive, used to be alive in the past, we have people who are now dead who seem to be still communicating in some way. There's also evidence that mind and brain can operate separately. Now we know there's lots of evidence that mind and brain are connected. People's brains are injured, they don't think as well as they used to. When you sleep, when your brain's turning off, you don't think as well as you do when you're awake. There's mountains of evidence connecting mind and brain. That's in the normal state. But in extreme states, they seem to separate. And there's an analogy here, again, with physics. Good old classic Newtonian mechanics works very well for the typical physical world we live in. It breaks down when you get to extremes of very fast speeds, very long distances. And for that, we need to invoke relativity. If you don't go anywhere near the speed of light, you don't have to worry about it. And so for a normal, everyday working life, the Tony mechanics works just fine. When you get to the extreme circumstances, you need relativity to understand what's going on. It's the same thing with mind and brain. And as long as we're dealing with our normal everyday life, mind and brain seem to be working together. As one skeptic says, mind is what the brain does. But it breaks down in extreme circumstances. And one of those extreme circumstances is when people die. There are many accounts of people who, <coughs> as they approach death, somehow regain their mental function. We have lots of people with Alzheimer's disease who families report in the last few hours before they died, they suddenly became clear again, recognized family again. We have reports in the medical literature of schizophrenics who've been crazy for years. And in the minutes or hours before they die, they become perfectly lucid again, perfectly sane again. What's going on here? We've got people, as their brain deteriorates, their mind seems to get better. And you have near-death experiences where people say, when my brain stopped functioning, I was thinking more clearer than I ever have before, faster than I have before, more lost than ever before. You have out-of-body experiences where people can see accurately from another perspective. Again, mind functioning independently of the brain. And we have various ways of detecting this thing that leaves the body. <coughs> There have been several studies looking at trying to detect something leaving the body during an out-of-body state, and the most successful detection device we've found has been a pet kitten. Where do NDEs fit in with this? Well, the typical skeptical response to this is that all this is just anecdotes, 
none of this is really verifiable scientifically. You're just telling me stories. And in fact, if you dismiss all this evidence, then you don't have to worry about trying to explain it. As the neuroscientist Paul Merrill said, if you eliminate data that don't agree, the remaining data agree very well. <laughs> So here's the role of NDEs in this. NDEs provide a lot of evidence, not proof, but evidence that really pushes you towards the belief in survival. We certainly have people whose brains are function whose brains are not functioning, but whose minds are functioning better than ever. This suggests that mind can function without the brain. Does this prove the mind can function after the brain dies? Not necessarily. Maybe the mind is still dependent on the brain, even though it's physically separated. Stressing, you can make arguments here. You also have NDEs to report accurately what's going on from an out of body perspective. I was up on the ceiling and I saw all these things happen. They also report what was happening back at home while they are unconscious on the operating table. You also have NDEs reporting seeing and communicating with deceased loved ones. They can't do that if the loved ones are not still in existence. Finally, we have what we call peak and daring end cases. These are cases in which the near-death experiencer <clears throat> sees people who are dead that nobody knew was dead, were dead. So you can't attribute it to, I expected to see them because nobody knew they were dead. Maggie Callan, who's a hospice nurse in Virginia, has a wonderful book called, oh, it's just left my mind. Final gifts, thank you. Final gifts talking about the experiences of people as they are dying. And she tells a beautiful story about a Chinese woman who was dying of cancer. And her family was gathered around her day after day with a deathbed vigil. And one day she gets very agitated. And she, they can't calm her down. And finally asked her, what's going on? And she said, I've been seeing my deceased relatives seeing my mother, I've been seeing my father, and I've been very reassured by that, but this morning, I had a visit from my sister. I don't understand that because she is alive and well in China. And they got very upset. And the nurse who was working with her, the nurse did this also. So the nurse, when the family came to visit, said to them, your mother told me this fantastic story this morning that she was visiting her sister. My children turned white and said, My sister died two days ago. And we didn't tell us we didn't want to upset her. Hmm. So this woman, approaching death, had a visit from her dead sister that she didn't know was dead. Okay. Where do we go from here? Why do they call it peak and barrier? Uh, this comes from a poem by uh, Keats about Cortez uh, crossing, the, uh, going over the Panama Isthmus, and the Darien was the place of power. He came to the peak and saw the totally unexpected Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. And this name was given to it by Francis Cobb in 1892 in a book by that name describing NDEs with these peak and Darien experiences. This stuff's been around for a long time. I think near-death experience research is still in its infancy. We've been doing this 30 years. We're just scratching the surface. We have new, less invasive neuroimaging techniques that we can use now that tell us what's going on in the brain that we didn't have 30 years ago. We have new research paradigms that let us, let us do prospective studies we couldn't do 30 years ago. There's a lot going on. Will this research tell us what death is all about? Can change people's image of death. <laughs> Will this research tell us how to be more in tune with the universe? <clears throat> Will it tell us how the mind and the brain interact? <clears throat> Is all the key to the universe? Where's that key to the universe? One of my favorite philosophers, this is Swami Beyond Ananda, who said the bad news is there is no key to the universe. The 
goodness is, it's been left unlocked. <laughs> Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left for questions. Why do some people have NDEs and others do not? We have not the slightest clue. We've looked at all the obvious things, and the things you usually look at, age, gender, race, religion, religiosity, spirituality, like the way people come close to death, have no bearing on whether you will have an NDE or what kind you will have. We do have some <clears throat> subtle personality traits that are more common in NDEers than in other people. We don't know yet whether those were existing before the NDE, more likely they would have them or not. Again, we need more of these prospective studies. But all the obvious things that you think would make people have NDEs, particularly the physiological things people proposed, don't have any bearing on it. A related question is, is it possible to produce uh, NDE experimentally? It would seem to be a very desirable thing in terms of personality and life. The question was about inducing NDEs experimentally. There have been a number of people who have tried this by hypnosis or guided imagery, uh, by giving drugs. Um, there are some drugs that seem to mimic the NDE sometimes. Um, there's, a, there's one researcher who claims to be able to reproduce the NDE by applying electromagnetic uh, forces to the brain. He has people wear a helmet that applies a magnetic field to the right temporal lobe, and he claims that they have NDEs. In fact, what they have is a sense as if they are leaving the body. They don't say, I'm leaving my body. They say, I feel as if I'm leaving my body. They don't describe things from another perspective. They describe a sense as if there's another presence in the room with me. They don't describe seeing deceased relatives. They describe a sense as if there's another entity in the room with me. Most importantly, they are not in another realm when they're doing this. They're sitting there talking to the researchers saying, Oh yes, now it feels like I'm leaving my body. It doesn't happen with NDEs. I think most importantly, these people are not changed at all after the experience, after the induced experience. I think what we found is that you can induce something that mimics an NDE with drugs or with magnetic fields or with hypnosis, but people don't have the same after effects. I think this is something that is given to you that you can't take. You have to kill them first. Or almost killed. <laughs> well, you know, there was that movie, Flatliners, where medical yeah. students tried this with each other. And my guess is that that will not work. <laughs> that an important part of having an NDE and of getting any benefit from it is a sense of giving up control, of letting go of your ego. And as long as you're trying to induce the experience, you're not giving up. <clears throat> you're holding on and retaining the importance of that ego part of you that's not going to survive an NDE. about what, what are we going, where are we going in the future with this. I think we're going to go where the te technology allows us to go, unfortunately, which means that a lot of what we're going to do is better and better physiological research on this, better and better psychological research, and more slow progress on the spiritual aspects of it. Uh, we're still making progress, but it's going to be slower. I should say that when we find what's going on in the brain when you have an NDE, and we'll find that. That won't mean that these changes in the brain are causing the NDE. Much has been made of the fact that you can stimulate a portion of the right temporal lobe, and people will feel as if they are leaving their bodies. And people say, oh, that's because when you stimulate that part of the brain, that gives the illusion of an OBE. Therefore, all OBEs are just, all antibody experiences are just illusions caused by brain stimulation. That's a frequency device, right? What's yeah. the name of it? Do you know the name of it? The name of? Uh, there, are, there are many that do that. There are many that have done that. But most of this research has been done by neurosurgeons on patients who are being operated on for epilepsy. What about many voices? What, uh, many lights, many masters? Uh, are you familiar with that? I am. Let me continue with this train of thought, though, because hmm. if you stimulate that same part of the temporal lobe, you'll also get memories, for example, of a symphony playing. 
does that mean that symphonies don't really exist? They just, they're just an artifact of stimulation of the brain. Of course not. In fact, you can argue that if you can stimulate the brain and get an illusion of something, then that thing must exist in reality, else you couldn't have an illusion from it. If you can stimulate the brain and get a memory of hearing a symphony, you must have had the symphony. You must have heard it before to have that memory of it. It's the same way with the OBE. If you can stimulate the brain and have the illusion of leaving your body, that doesn't mean you can't really leave the body. Brian Weiss has done work with regressing people to previous lives, uh, primarily in a therapeutic way to deal with their opiates and other problems in this life. Um, one of the problems with Weiss's work is that he's not concerned with trying to corroborate the details of the life. He's just looking at it from a therapeutic perspective. So we can't use his stuff scientifically to prove or disprove what's going on. We can say that it's helpful to people to do this. But he's not concerned about whether it's real or not. In fact, it's fine with him if they're making it up as long as it's helpful. Catherine was uh, transformed. Uh, yes, people are certainly transformed by this. Yeah. What about Michael Newton's work where he does the life between lives kind of thing? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, there are people who have been regressed to the period between lives. Uh, I should say that I have some. Uh, hesitation about accepting anything that comes to in hypnosis because in hypnosis there's a lot of desire to please the hypnotist. So we sometimes get things that are unreliable in hypnosis. That doesn't mean it's all unreliable. It means we can't tell what's reliable and what's not. A lot of people who are abreast of previous lives have legitimate memories. A lot of them don't. And it's hard to sort out what's the real and what's the not real. That's why in our work with children who remember previous lives we don't use hypnosis. We only use children who spontaneously talk about <coughs> the pre yeah. How will society benefit from a better understanding of NDEs? How does society benefit from a better understanding of NDEs? Now look at the world around you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a particularly loving world. It's not a compassionate world. And the most profound changes we see after NDEs are the sense of we're all in this together. Hmm. Basically the golden rule. What you do to someone else, you do to yourself. Hmm. And in the context of an NDE, hurting someone else makes no sense at all. You're hurting yourself. If everyone could have an NDE, would this be a better world? Yeah. 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 If would we could survive? spread the message without giving people NDEs, would it be a better world? Mm -hmm. There's some evidence that you can. There have been two studies now done, one by Ken Ring in Connecticut and one by uh, Chuck Flynn at Miami University of Ohio, who have taught courses in NDEs. And they did psychological testing of the, children, of the students before the course started and after the course ended. And they found that just studying about NDEs in an academic setting makes these people more loving and more compassionate. Now, I had a question. You had compared um, some mental illnesses, and um, I've worked a lot, you know, being in psychiatry and integrated medicine, but I've worked a lot with uh, people who are bipolar, and the state of, uh, you know, being hypomanic or manic has joyfulness, sometimes no med response, and that people are very altruistic, connected, experience the light, and transform, you know, like having been trained conventionally and also alternatively in the last 16 years, what I've found is people can transform and heal completely from what we call bipolar illness and are completely changed. And I wonder if there's been any correlation or studies looking at the light experiences or what we call hypomania, you know, and near death. Because it seems like that's a way of not having a full near death experience, <coughs> but still bringing that back <coughs> into the world and also correlating. Yeah, there really hasn't been any research on that. Most people look at the, the manic state or the hypomanic state as being a temporary thing, a time limited thing mm -hmm. that doesn't by itself have long lasting after effects. And in fact, most people who are in that manic state, mm -hmm. although they may be very uh, loving, right. they're also very self absorbed and grandiose for themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't have the humility that you see in, in spirituality. And, and so I think that brings up this whole issue for me of, you know, I think you had a side of there of like, um, the researcher sees what they want to. Yes. <laughs> you know, sort of like what the bleak, you know? Right. Like, well, 
we think we want to see is what we see, you know, and I've spoken to Bessel van der Kolk about that on PTSD, you know, and we talked about trauma and can it resolve, and how does that relate to bipolar illness and parts work, you know, and so we were talking about, well, we see what we want to see, and some things can change and some things can, but if we believe it cannot change, then we forget that it can. That's right. So it's kind of interesting. How do you intend to uh, bring, bring this information to the mass population? How do we bring this information to the mass? That's what yeah. we're doing right now. question as we are out of time, but you can you can write your questions after this. The question is basically, you know, how do we bring this to everybody? And I think we just do it word of mouth, you talk to the person next to you. Most of my work is not done with the public. Most of my work is done with doctors and nurses and medical students, trying to convince them that they need to pay attention to this. And I have seen tremendous changes in the 30 years I've been doing this. When we first started doing these talks, at medical societies 30 years ago, I would give a talk, and there would be <coughs> light response, and then after the talk was over, doctors would come to me individually, telling me about their experiences. Now, they stand up in the middle of the group and tell about it in front of the whole group. So there is a change. Do you have actual statistics on that too? Yes, we are. We are the message out to doctors and nurses that no matter what these experiences are, no matter what you think they are, they are tremendously important to your patients. They're going to affect their lives. And you better know about them if you want to treat them properly. Okay. Just one thing. My sick father, Next month, uh, we have, are having private sessions. If you're interested in a private session with our speakers,